welcome. All right, hi everybody. Thank you, thank you for the invite, and happy to be here and share. All right, so yeah, thanks, thanks again for the invite. I'm, I'm Brock Reesberg, and I'm the production engineering manager with Greylock Energy, uh, based out here out of Charleston, West Virginia. Today, I'm going to go over my story and background, and kind of how I've got to where I am today. And I'll, I'll talk about petroleum engineering and, and kind of the different subdisciplines within petroleum engineering. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the research and work I do on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and then some of the STEM skills that, that contribute to petroleum engineering as a career, and then what you can do as, as teachers for support and how to push students into, into STEM. So I was born and raised in Grand Junction, Colorado, which is on the western slope, kind of on the, the border with, with Utah. Um, I went to Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado. My mom was an elementary teacher for over 30 years, and my grandpa was a chemistry professor at a local college in Mesa State, which is now called Mesa for a very long time. So I have a very great appreciation for educators, and, and I'm, I'm really happy that I get to contribute and, and help when I can. Um, I graduated, um, went to the Colorado School of Mines. I, I always loved math and science growing up and, and going through college and, or high school. I loved math. It was always my favorite subject. And I distinctly remember when I applied for the Colorado School of Mines, one of the, the requirements was not an essay. So I was never a big fan of <laughs> writing essays or English. So I didn't have to write an essay. So it was the only college I applied to and I got accepted and, and that was it. So went on from there. Um, when I started doing my, my campus tours, so, so the Colorado School of Mines, for, for those of you that, that aren't familiar, it's a, it's a smaller D2 school that focuses mainly on engineering. Um, they have mechanical, civil, electrical are probably the big three. And then we also have mining, petroleum, chemical, metallurgical engineering, a bunch of other you know, smaller um, engineering disciplines. And when I first did my, my um, orientation, we got to do a couple of department tours. And I remember specifically going to the petroleum one and the department head at the time was a man named Dr. Craig Van Kirk and his enthusiasm and, and everything surrounding petroleum engineering is what pushed me into it. So he had a great presentation and just, just, just his, his enthusiasm and, and drive of how he supported the department um, is kind of what, what pushed me into petroleum, not having really known anything about petroleum engineering prior to that. So he, he talked about uh, touring the world and basically there's, there's no boring day within the petroleum industry or the oil field. So his enthusiasm kind of drove me into that. Um, I, and I pretty much never looked back from there. I fell in love with petroleum and, and loved it all through college. And, and I've been in the industry now for 10 years and, and love what I do. Uh, out of school, I went to Fort Worth, Texas and started as a field engineer working for um, a service company. So in, in oil and gas, we have service companies and we have operators. Um, on the service company side, I, I like to relate it to building a house. So when you have a house, somebody's the contractor and then you have all your subcontractors. So the contractor goes and hires the plumber, the electrician, um, the concrete pours and everything. The, and so um, the contractor in our world is the operator where they actually own oil and gas rights and then they subcontract all the work out to the well. So drilling the fracking, everything outside of that gets hired out. So I worked for um, the service side for the first five, well, first seven years of my career. So I went to Fort Worth, um, spent a couple of years there, and then I transferred to Midland, Texas for a year. And then I went to San Antonio, Texas for five years. And then just two and a half years ago, I moved here to Charleston, West Virginia, and started with Greylock Energy. Uh, I have a wife of seven years named Rachel. I have a five-year-old son named Lynn, who just turned five last this last Tuesday on Groundhog Day. And then I've got another son. Uh, his name is going to be Brody. That's due here in the next few weeks. And then we have our a mini dachshund named Jack. And we love everything outside um, West Virginia. My first time in West Virginia was my interview, so it was it was definitely something new. And we've we've thoroughly enjoyed being out here and exploring and trying new things. Um, so just just a little about Craylock. We're headquartered here in Charleston. We have operations across West Virginia, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania. Um, all in total, we have about 4,400 wells and 2,600 miles of pipeline. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the Marcellus Shale, we have about 130 Marcellus Shale wells of that 4,400. And then the rest are conventional wells that have been drilled as far back as the 1920s, 1930s, 40s, 50s. All We have wells of kind of every vintage from, from when um, oil and gas exploration kind of first started up here. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I, I put our 
kind of the stuff off our website there. But I think the biggest thing for the company is our, our mission is produce energy that powers our communities. So especially with this upcoming weekend and these brutally cold, uh, this brutal cold coming down, it's natural gas that's, that's heating your house and, and keeping everybody warm through, through the cold. So I, I knew growing up, I, I didn't really know what petroleum engineering was. I figured you just get in your car and you drive and gas comes out of the ground and, and then uh, gas heats your house, but we really don't know where it comes from. So petroleum engineering is, is the specific discipline that uh, the, in the industry of petroleum engineering is our background of what we do to get oil and gas out of the ground and to the marketplace. Um, so there's a few sub-disciplines within petroleum engineering that are drilling, completions, production, and reservoir. So I'm a production engineer. Um, as far as getting oil and gas out of the ground, it includes all kinds of STEM-related um, other backgrounds, including geology, geophysics, petrophysics. Um, after it goes downstream, all kinds of chemistry from, from processing and downstream, um, geomechanics, uh, reservoir engineering, thermodynamics, and then surface familiars. And, and economics is another big portion, too, which doesn't always get talked about in STEM, but economics is a big portion in, in doing things economically. So I'll kind of touch on each of these subcategories. So the first one is drilling. So kind of going through the, the life cycle of a well. Um, if you look on this picture here, on, on the left is, is one of our big rigs that we drilled um, last year. So. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm going to pop in. Actually, um, I can't see your screen. Oh, you can't. No. So if you go down to the bottom green button, you should be able to screen share. Yeah. It's okay. I apparently was not screen sharing the first parts of my presentation, and I definitely <laughs> thought I was. So. There we go. Is that better? I, I still not, hmm. You should be able to pick, click the green button and then pick your PowerPoint slides. There you go. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no worries. I just wanted to, I didn't want to, you know, um, figure, you know, I'd pop in. Yeah, before you right. referencing. All right, so on the left here is a drilling rig. So this is this is a big rig of what we, we drill um, these modern day horizontal wells with. So this this was one rig that we brought in last year and we drilled five wells off of this particular pad. So even, even beyond that, we, we actually do the pad construction. So especially in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, um, just building the pad in itself is an exercise. Um, you can see there's that's a pickup truck there on the left. So you can see the scale and size of how big this rig is. And then down here in the little wells, you can see we have five wells lined up here that this particular rig drilled. So if you guys are, a lot of a lot has been talked about about hydraulic fracturing and, and unconventional wells. So this, this, this particular pad, we drilled five wells off of, and this the Marcella Shale is typically around 8,200 foot thick in our area. So we drilled five wells off of here, and this well goes down 8,200 foot laterally, so almost a mile and a half down, and then another um, the scale is a little compressed, but this is 9,000 feet, and then this is almost 15,000 foot at the end, so almost another mile and a half um, horizontally out. So this is, on the right here, is kind of a drilling frog. So we target a specific zone. So with technologies that we have today, we're targeting this red section, which is about an eight-foot thick section of zone. So by all the, all the technology that's come forward in the last 10 years, we've been able to target a zone as, as small as five feet thick. And we drill that out and follow that zone for two and a half, almost two, two miles out sometimes as, as far as longer lateral goes. And we're able to stay in that zone. And we get, we get this information real time through um, drilling fluids. So we're able to process data down at the bit and we get it back at surface. And then we know and, and we can adjust which direction we're drilling underground. Um, our drilling engineers also work really close with our geologists and our geophysicists. So after a well is drilled and we put um, multiple layers of pipe and cement behind it to protect the fresh water zones above it, we do the next step, which is called fracking. So I'm sure a lot of people have heard um, fracking. So what we do in fracking is we, we shoot holes in the pipe that's underground, and then we pump millions of gallons of, of water and millions of pounds of sand that we call prop it into formations. And we do this in order to create um, an artificial hydraulic fracture network. So it basically the oil and gas is so tight underground that it can't be produced naturally. So we pump this in order to create a complex fracture network. And then all the natural gas and oil goes into your well bore and ends up coming to surface. Um, a couple of the, the unique things that, that have come up in the last few years um, that we've tried to promote a lot is so on the picture on the left here is our, our frac fleet actually fracturing those same wells that that drilling rig was on. 
and on the right is the the plain view portion of, of those wells so you see the 1h 2h 3h and 7h are the wells that we completed that you saw on the previous slide so that's the lateral portion so in order to fracture a well we set multiple barriers between um, so many certain feet apart 200 feet apart and we pump individual stages so fracking these all four of these wells took about a month just to go and pump all the water and sand down hole and we do pump chemicals too but the chemical is such a tiny portion of, of what we pump um, in, in comparison it's less than a percent of the total volume that we pump down hole so we pump this sand and water at high pressure down hole and we create a network of fractures that gas can flow into one of the things we've done lately on this particular pad, we've used our own pipeline system to feed. So typically these trucks um, that pump the water, pump the pressure, pump water at 9,000, 10,000 pounds of pressure PSI. Um, we use our own gas on this particular pad. So instead of using diesel and trucking diesel to this pad, we have a pipeline that comes off of our existing wells and feeds into this pad. And then they process it right here in one of these trucks and it sends it over to these trucks. So instead of, we pump a, a blend, we still pump a diesel, but we pump a blend of our own natural gas. So we're reducing the amount of trucks we have on and we're also reducing emissions um, by pump, by using clean natural gas burning instead of pure diesel. Another really cool thing that we've started to do now is we pump chemical tracers. So there's a couple different companies, but we use one particular that sends um, a chemical marker so while we're pumping these stages, we, we try and make sure we're getting as much of the rock as possible. So we have these wells spaced out. Um, over time, we've, we've kind of narrowed in on how far it's spaced these wells out. And we use these chemical tracers to determine if these wells are seeing communication between each other. So while we're pumping these, we're real time, we're pumping chemical trackers down. And as we produce the wells, we can tell if we were efficiently um, got access to the entire rock and we're efficiently draining the whole reservoir. So after the well is drilled and it's been fracked and we produce it, we have reservoir engineers um, that do modeling for us. Um, so this particular graph is kind of, at, at when we produce a well, up here is kind of our, our production in, in um, million standard cubic foot per, per lateral foot. So it's kind of normalized based on the length of a horizontal well. So in black is kind of what, well, this, 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 this graph actually shows kind of the efficiency that we've gained. So. In 2018, this was an average well for us, the, this blue line. And just with the additional technology and kind of our updated completions, we've been able to achieve this green line on our last year's pad. And that's that's where production has gone so far the last few years, especially in uh, in the March cellars, is we've become so efficient and kind of narrowed in all the parameters that we're, we're getting the most gas out of the well for the least amount of work. So our reservoir engineers do all our modeling and kind of they do a lot of economic analysis and determine how much money are we going to spend versus how much are we going to get back? Um, they've also started to use a lot more big data and machine learning, if it's, it's kind of a buzzword that's out there right now, and artificial intelligence to, to assist in modeling. So we've got a lot of modeling systems that uh, they can do that for us as well. The last step um, in any phase of, of an oil and gas well is the production phase. And that is what I'm, I'm our production manager. So this screenshot um, is, an, is a, a specific well. So one of these new wells that came online. So we've monitored various parameters. So in the dark red is the actual production of the well. So this well came on at over 16 million standard cubic feet a day. We monitor pressures. And then we also monitor the amount of water that the well makes as it comes back. Uh, one of the things that's come to light recently is, is cloud-based data. So this particular screenshot, I can monitor any of our 135 Marcellus wells at any time of day from my computer or my phone. I can see exactly what that well is doing. This particular graph only shows daily intervals, but I have data down to the, the five minute intervals or even the minute intervals on some wells. So that's some of the things that are coming to light, especially with the technology side, is being able to see real time what's happening with your wells versus in the old days, you have a chart on a well that gets picked up once a month. And if a well has a problem, it's reactive and you're going out and fixing it days or weeks or even months later where now we see a problem, we're on it that, that exact minute or that next day. One of the, the key um, objectives of my job too is, is optimization. So once we drill the well, wells um, decline on a, on a log base curve. So this, this is the production of a well. It starts off producing a lot and, and as it goes through its life, it starts to reduce. So this particular well came online in 2013 and you can see it, it continues to decline through its life. Um, so we manage that decline. So this particular well, we have different means of increasing the production or maintaining production. 
So this black line is kind of the model on what the predicted life based on the reservoir, they've predicted the life of this well to be. Uh, if we start to see issues, so you start to see these red bobbles, this well started to load up or the water production that came with it started to reduce the gas. So one of the things we can do is an artificial lift. So artificial lift are different ways that we can help lift the gas out of the well once it starts to decline. So this was this particular well, you can see it's producing a lot of gas, it loads up with water and the gas drops off, it unloads the water. We, we put a plunger system in, so it's basically a solid rod that helps lift the water out with the, the well's own power. So once we put it on a plunger lift, you can kind of see the smooth red line is what we're looking for is a consistent, flat, smooth production. Um, so that's just one, one example of, of a well that we would put artificial lift on. Another portion of production engineer's job is a workover. So if we have issues with a certain well, so like I said, we can monitor real time if we see an issue. So this particular well was producing fine. We started to have issues um, sometime in March of 2018. It had a big issue and production went all the way to zero. Um, so I, as a production engineer, have to figure out why did it go to zero? What can we do to mediate that? And, and what's it gonna cost? So first thing we look at is the economic feasibility of doing a project. And then I select vendors to, to do the work. So this is a particular workover rig that, that assisted in getting this well back online. Um, so we, we only have what we know, what we see on surface. We can actually see what's going on down hole without, with our eyes. So we have different tools and means to evaluate what's going on down hole. So this particular well, we had um, some sand buildup in the bottom. So we pulled out the tubing. So the, the producing path for the gas we pulled out with this rig. We did a clean out. Um, so we went in with kind of a roto rooter, which is coiled tubing. We go in, we clean the well out, get all the sand out, come back out, and then you can see it return back to, to its normal production. So this was a successful work over. Uh, one other piece of, of production engineering and, and production is, is flow back. So once we pump those millions of gallons of water down hole, we have to bring it all back to surface and then the well continue to make water through its life. So we do a lot of, of modeling um, because we're dealing, so this, this particular pad made 105,000 barrels of water or um, we made, we, as a company, we made 16 million gallons of water in 2020. Um, and when we're doing these fracturing jobs, we, if we as an industry recycle as much of that water as possible. So it comes to surface and the Marcellus and, and the Northeast Appalachian operators in particular do a really good job of water sharing. So all, all of the water that we produced last year went to other operators and their fracturing operations. So that, that, that bulk water, um, that water cycle, it gets put down hole, comes back to surface and then goes to other operators or goes back in our operation. And we end up, um, we still pull fresh water, but the, we're, we've gotten much more efficient in recycling water the last, uh, I'd say five or six years as an industry. But one of the things we have to model and be prepared for is how much we're how much water we're going to make. Um, so that's one of my jobs too is tracking how much water. So in here we've got the dark blue line of based on our historic wells what what we thought the well was going to make on a, on water and barrels per day per lateral foot. And then you can see kind of the, the different colored lines. That's what each of the wells actually made. So our model was was pretty accurate in this case. And then the, the last stage of, of any oil and gas well is plugging and abandonment. Um, so that's part of, part of my job too. So we've got 4,400 wells of those wells, the, they, once they go through their, their economic life cycle, we have to plug and abandon them. So we responsibly plug wells. So this was up near Clearfield, Pennsylvania. Last summer I was up there with, with one of my colleagues and we, we plugged four wells up in Pennsylvania. So when we plug, we, we pull certain strings of the casing out and then we pump um, cement plugs. So we pump multiple hundred feet of plugs across where these wells used to produce from. Uh, and we, we pump multiple plugs of gel and cement and we plug all the way back to surface. And then we make sure no oil and gas is coming back to surface. Um, so that's always, it's, it's not the most glamorous part of the job, but it's a responsible part that has to be done. Um, so we, we've got a set side, a set certain budget every year that we dedicate to plugging and uh, we continue to plug wells that, that are no longer economic or at the end of their life or have other issues down hole. So lastly, on the, on the STEM skills and student support. So 
going back to, to um, what kind of drove me into petroleum engineering, I think the biggest thing you guys can do as educators is promote and recognize passion for math, science, and problem solving. Um, I, I remember very distinctly of certain teachers in high school and even middle school that you could just tell they were enthusiastic about what they were doing, and, and it made me excited and want to stay in math and science. Um, I think some of the classes that specific for petroleum and, and engineering in general, um, I use algebra, calculus, um, chemistry, very much so, um, with water, um, geology, economics, which necessarily isn't STEM, but it always plays into um, industry, physics and geophysics, and then a big one that's, that's really come up, obviously, in the last few years is computer science. So even as engineers, we need to know how to use softwares, um, how, to, how to even code to an extent, but how to use different types of softwares to, to help but make us make better decisions and real-time decisions to be the most efficient that we can be. Um, one note too, even, even outside of STEM, the, the, the oil field that doesn't always get brought up is how many other industries and other, other uh, career pathways that we support. So like I said, we have geologists, um, the industry supports electricians, mechanics, we need IT support, accountants, welders and fabricators, and then our foremen, our well tenders and all the other people that, that work in the field. So even if you don't necessarily have kids that are fully enthusiastic about STEM, there's all kinds of support functions that go into the oil and gas industry as well. Um, I would say if, if you have kids that, that do have that passion, definitely push them to take AP classes when possible. I think it's a, that was a great prep. I took AP calculus in high school and it was a great prep for, for college for me. Um, it got me on the right path and actually learned how to study and how to do homework and how to prepare for tests. And, and I think it was a really good, good preparation for college. Um, math and science fairs and competitions. I, I did a couple of, of science fairs growing up. My grandpa ran the science fair at the college that he worked at for, for a number of years. He, he started it and ran it. So I think those are great ways to get kids excited and get, get recognition for what they do. Um, guest speakers are always great. Field trips, um, college visits. And then the, the last other point I had is one of my favorite uh, things about the, that I use for access on a, on a daily and weekly basis is the Energy Information Administration. They have a ton of great information as far as um, the whole energy and how the entire U.S.'s energy supply. So not just oil and gas, but wind, solar, coal, and everything that goes into it. Um, and they do have a section for kids that has um, a lot of resources for teachers, for, for kids of all ages. And... Yeah, so the last piece, um, this, this map here, as you can see, the, you probably would never know, and I didn't even really know before looking it up, but the U.S. has 1.7 million active oil and gas wells that are producing right now. So even though we're starting our, our transition and our energy shift and, and clean and renewable energies, which, which I think we should all be full supporters of, that natural gas is the, the ideal bridge fuel. It is the cleanest burning, and it's what's going to get us to that next level. So we definitely need more wind, more hydro, more solar, but natural gas is, is going to be the perfect bridge field to get us to that next step. And it's going to be that for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and yeah, Greylock doesn't have any formal education, but I would be happy to, to make classroom visits. I know there's plenty of other colleagues within Greylock. They would, they would love to come to the classroom and, and share what we do and, and uh, fire up kids to, to get excited about our industry as well. So that's, that's all I've got. Um, yeah, unless there's, there's questions. Wonderful, thank you. And of course, there's always questions. The teachers, teachers <laughs> have lots of questions. Um, yeah, I'll start. I start somewhere here, I guess. Um, so, how does fracking impact groundwater? So, in in the shortest sense, it doesn't. So, when we drill those wells, your your groundwater tables typically below a thousand feet, and when we drill, we set multiple layers of casing and cement or pipe. So there's, in, in our well specifically, we have four layers of casing that run across the water zone so that, that we make sure when we go down to our producing zone, that natural gas never sees any of the groundwater. So that groundwater table is at four, five, six hundred, as, as deep as 1,500 feet. We're all the way down at 8,000 feet. So we have multiple layers of rock. And then for our flow path, we have multiple layers of cement and casing that protect that specifically. Okay, so does that, does that, is Greylock more, um, I guess, careful about that then? Yeah. and, and In as, terms of the fracking and uh, drilling for natural gas? Yeah, absolutely. And in, in the industry as a whole, we've gotten a lot better as far as protecting groundwater and being more cognizant of how we affect um, groundwater around us. There's always been, even when you go back to the early wells, there's always layers of casing and cement. 
But with these horizontal wells, we've gotten to where we set multiple, multiple levels. So it's not just one failure. If there's a failure point, you've got another three barriers behind that that ever keep that gas from, from reaching the water table. Okay. Um, and then what happens to the well pad when the site is closed? Yeah, so when the site's closed, we reclaim everything back to as close to its original. Um, so that particular pad, we, we cleared out, I don't know how many acres of trees and created that slope. After we're done with our entire operation, the footprint of, of what you will see is just that basically maybe, maybe 10, 15 feet on either side of that. And then we'll reclaim everything around that pad kind of to its original contour. We'll plant grass and then trees when, when possible as well. But everything gets reclaimed except for that, that pad where the wells are. Okay. Um, if you were not a petroleum engineer, what type of engineer would you be? So that's really a good question. My, my backup going into school was mining, which, um, you know, I, I think that probably would still hold true today. I, I think I'd probably consider civil mechanical electrical just because you can you basically go into any industry with civil mechanical electrical. Um, but I always like the mining side as well. And with the way things are going for um, solar and, and, and everything else, as far as all the heavy metals and everything, I think mining engineering is also going to be really prominent for the future outside of just coal mining and, and precious metals. Yeah, my um, cousin actually manages a silver mine in Nevada. Okay, cool. And he loves it. <laughs> and I also believe he went to the Colorado School of Mining. Did he? Yeah, but he's like 50 something. So. That's cool. That was actually, yeah, it was that, started that, for, for mining. That's, yeah, Colorado School of Mines, obviously, it's, yeah. Um, and then, um, so what types of, I mean, you kind of spoke to this already with like electrical, civil, um, mechanical engineering, um, but is there like a specific type of engineering if someone was really interested in like clean energy? You know, there's, I don't know, I don't mind specifically have started developing different things around clean energy as far as um, hydro, hydraulic engineers. And I don't know if they specifically have anything for solar or wind as far as engineering goes. Um, but I know the shift has already started for those specifically to go into clean, clean energies and renewable energies. And I would imagine that, you know, certainly electrical and mechanical engineering would be good starting points. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Those, yeah, those are the big three as far as, you know, I think in my class, we graduated 90 in a petroleum. And I think between civil mechanical electrical was like 800. So that kind of gives you like, we're definitely a smaller niche within, within the energy. Um, Megan, you want to join? Sorry, she made, Megan made a comment that she can, I can answer the, for the solar engineering, solar energy engineering question. So you want to hop on Megan. Hey, sorry. Um, I just happened no, thank you. to know um, that through a program through Fairmont State, they do uh, chemistry with polymer um, polymer engineering. There's several um, research, or there's research into polymer engineering, which is a branch of chemical engineering for working with, like you said, the heavy metals to look at heavy metal compounds to help increase the efficiency of solar panel. And uh, like I said, Fairmont State has a great program where you can actually test different uh, metal salts to see the efficiency of absorption of solar energy. So there's a program you can actually do with your students through uh, Fairmont State with that, where they actually send Ooh. you materials. And yeah, it works with the solar energy as well. And they look at the heavy metals. It applies chemistry. People have done it in both middle school and in high school through um, one of our programs. Uh, so I just thought that might be anyone who's interested in maybe doing solar, you can get into chemistry, focusing on either polymers or with um, different kinds of oxidation chemistry. Awesome, thank you. And I will certainly look that up and if I can't figure it out, I'm gonna email you. Perfectly I will say fine. locally too, you know, University of West Virginia has a, has a, a bachelor's in, um, natural gas and petroleum, as well as uh, Marietta College. Marietta has, uh, has a bachelor's degree in petroleum. So a couple of local, there's, there's a lot of the people I work with are, are locals and from West Virginia and, and Ohio area and went to those schools too. Awesome. Um, and then I know, so you mentioned recovering water. Um, 
and then using it, you know, sharing it with other people. Like, guys, how, what percentage, like how much are you able to recover? Um, so certain operators, some of the bigger public companies that, that run full time, they, they actually recycle 100% of their water um, instead of pumping it down a disposal well. So the other way we get rid of water is pumping it down disposal wells, uh, which go into different different zones that, that have room for, for brine to be pumped down. Um, that's actually a really good question. I don't know the exact answer. I know we recycle, when, when we're fracking, we recycle 100% of ours. And last year, um, between other operators and, um, and ourselves, we recycled 95% of our produced water. So only 5% of what we produced last year went into a disposal well. Okay, cool. No, and I think it is, I mean, certainly sharing it with other, you know, companies who need water like that is super clever. Yeah. Instead of and having to use, you know, continually using fresh water and then trying to recycle it and make it, you know, yeah, safe, drinkable, yeah. whatever. And even though we're competitive, like it's, it's such a really tight knit, it's a really cool industry up here because all the companies work, I mean, they have to, they have to work hand in hand, even though we're, we're competitors, like it, unlike anywhere else I've worked, which was Texas, it's, it's a really unique industry up here in terms of collaboration. Plus people in West Virginia are just really nice. That too. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. So that's all the questions we have. Thank you so very much for presenting.